Hello again. Welcome to another distance AP psychology lesson. Today's topic is something called group dynamics, which is the science of how groups of people um, can influence each other's behavior and performance in various ways. I know it sounds like that's been the topic of this entire unit so far, but there are some specific um, phenomena that fall under group dynamics that we're going to focus on today. So what are our objectives? We're still focusing on situations, personal dispositions, and behavior, and how they influence each other. Um, there are some simulations of some of these group dynamics principles that you're going to engage in as part of the practice activity that goes with this lesson. Um, we're also going to explain something called the bystander effect and, and debunk some myths about it. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So group dynamics, like I said, is the study of how being in groups affects people's behavior. Um, there are several different principles that fall under this umbrella of group dynamics, we're going to start with what I think is the most interesting one, de-individuation. Now I know that is a really long word, but what de-individuation means is a loss of your sense of self-consciousness and restraint when you're in a large anonymous group setting. Many of you, when I had this, um, I know it seems like it was forever ago, but we did a warm-up where we were brainstorming various social situations where um, behavior would change. And one of the ones that came up pretty commonly were large crowds, pep rallies, sporting events, crowds at concerts, things like that. And that mob psychology, so to speak, the real name for that is de-individuation. De meaning a down, down or away from or a loss of. And then individual, like your sense of individual identity. And then Asian means it's a process, right? A noun. So de-individuation is accounting for why people's behavior in large anonymous crowds tends to be pretty awful, right? Um, people will riot when they get in large mobs and something makes them angry. At sports, at sporting events, fans can be very um, hooliganish, like rowdy, and they can fight and throw things and yell all kinds of stuff. Um, there's kind of an atmosphere that changes when you're in a large crowd. Like if you're at a comedy club or at a concert, things are more funny or more interesting or the music is somehow better when you're seeing it live with a whole bunch of people. That's because you kind of get lost in the large group. Um, you sort of lose your sense of self, you lose your sense of restraint, your inhibitions fall and you tend to act more like your id, more like sort of nature without any ego or self kind of inhibiting things. Um, Students will sometimes behave badly at pep rallies because they can't be individually identified. Or people on the internet will write all kinds of mean, nasty things to each other because there's basically no consequences. You're totally anonymous and there are millions of people on the internet. And so people get de-individuated and start to be horrible on the internet. Um, we're going to do a simulation for de-individuation and so the directions for that are listed. Um, what I want you to do for that are in the Google Classroom assignment. Next. Social facilitation, inhibition, and loafing. These ones are all related, and that's why I put them on the same slide. Social facilitation is what happens when the presence of other people facilitates or improves your performance. If you're really good at something, you're kind of an expert at a thing, then doing it in front of an audience or in front of a crowd, kind of that extra sort of pressure puts you on the edge and makes you perform better. But social inhibition is its opposite. If you are new at something, it's unfamiliar, you're not very good at it yet, um, the task itself is hard enough that you don't need that extra pressure from the crowd. And in fact, having the extra pressure makes your performance suffer. This has to do with arousal, arousal theory, right? If you're, if you're really good at a task already, then you're not quite interested enough by it to put yourself in that optimal level of arousal. But if something is already difficult for you, you're already in your optimal arousal zone just doing the task. So the extra pressure from the crowd makes your performance worse. So these are called social facilitation and social inhibition, um, which your performance can either improve or suffer in the presence of others, depending on your previous skill at that task. A third one is social loafing. And this is one that I'm pretty certain you are all familiar with. Social loafing is what happens when people will exert less effort when they're working on projects in groups. If your individual contribution is impossible to identify and you're working in a team, people will exert less effort, basically everyone. And I know you probably all have either done this or been on the receiving end of it. I know I've done both myself. Um, sometimes when you get in a group, you just kind of slack off a little because nobody's gonna tell whether you did your full effort or not. So why put in 
But then other times you end up be the, being the one stuck holding the bag because everyone else in your group has engaged in some social loafing. Um, so that one should be one I think that you guys are all pretty familiar with. Next, group polarization. This is, so remember polarized means opposite, right? If you have something that's a very polar thing, then you have really sort of extreme opposite views about it, right? So group polarization is what happens if you have a group of people that all kind of agree on something. When they talk about that thing, their opinions get more extreme. Group ideas are enhanced or made stronger by continued discussion. This really only works if the group is kind of homogenous at the beginning. They have to all kind of be in agreement. Now, you might have some people that are that their view is like more extreme or less extreme, but everyone is kind of on the same page at the beginning. The more they discuss something, the stronger or more extreme those views are going to become. Um, for example, politics. Politics is a really good example of group polarization. If you get a group of people together that all share a political view, the more they talk about that viewpoint, the more extreme their view is going to get. So if you get a group of people on the left, Democrats, together to talk, they're going to get more left, more Democrat as they speak, as they discuss. Same for conservatives. If you get a group of Republicans together, the more they discuss politics, the more Republican, the more extremely conservative those ideas are going to become. Um, but this can help. This can be seen in other ways besides just political discussions. You can see it in self-help groups, um, that the more people in the support group talk about trying their best and sort of lifting each other up and working hard, the more conviction the people in that group will have to try to do those things. Um, people, if you get a bunch of people together that are already prejudiced and then have them talk about race, they're just going to get more prejudiced, not less so. The group has to be mixed to prevent group polarization from happening. Um, if you, so the way polarization happens is if the group is all homogenous. So if you have people with a bunch of different viewpoints discussing, the opposite happens. People tend to come back towards the middle instead of getting more polarized. Um, so the similarity of a group makes that similarity stronger. Next is group think. Group think is what happens when you sort of end up thinking in a whole group or sort of sharing a schema and your individual um, different opinions or alternative ideas that might come up, you suppress them or override them because the desire to be unanimous with the group is stronger than that desire to have your individual opinion shared. This can result in groups making bad decisions or not considering all, all the alternatives because each individual who might have thought of a reason why that decision wasn't good just goes along with the group anyway to avoid rocking the boat. Right, so there are some um, circumstances that make group think much more likely. First, the group, um, if the group is highly cohesive, if everybody's in a strong team, there's already a strong bond, um, then the desire to break that bond or go against the team is going to be lessened. So that's a big one. Um, second, if there is a distinct strong leader, if there's somebody in charge that's like, yes, you know, this is what we're going to do, and I have a really forceful dominant personality, that makes group think more likely because people want to go along with that leader. If the group is isolated from outside influence, it's harder for individuals to try to dissent from the group because there's no real outside influence to help change people's minds. Um, fourth, if there's stress or time pressure. If people are under stress, they tend already not to consider a lot of alternatives, and if there's time pressure, you don't want to be the one that's slowing things down and being disruptive. So you tend to just suppress that thought. And finally, if the leader's already made a decision. If I'm a leader, this is what we're going to do, I've already decided, then each individual person in that group is much less likely to try to bring up an objection um, when that team is strong and the leader's already made a choice. The sort of biggest but sober example of groupthink is the Challenger Explosion. In 1986, a rocket ship was sent up. This was the first rocket um, sent up by NASA to orbit the Earth with civilians in it. There was a school teacher um, and some news people and astronauts, of course, on board this um, rocket. And there was a lot of stress and pressure from the public and from the government to get this rocket launching because the launch had already been delayed a number of times due to weather and bad conditions. And so this was basically it. Like, we've got all the public are interested in this. If the rocket doesn't go up now, NASA funding is going to get slashed and nobody's going to want to support the space program anymore. So we've got to send this rocket up. So even though there were signs of malfunction, there were signs of a problem, no individual member of NASA brought them up and stopped the launch. They all went along with the group because they didn't want to be the one to ruin 
this challenger launch, this big public event, they didn't want to be the one person stopping everything and ruining the whole space program, basically, because of their one objection. So each individual person on that team suppressed their objections. Nobody brought up the real risk um, of the malfunctions that caused the Challenger to explode. And after it launched, it exploded in the atmosphere and everyone on board was killed. So it's a huge tra tragedy. You can go ahead and look up the Challenger explosion if you want to read more about what happened, if you did not know about it. But basically, the a main driver for why none of those objections were brought up was groupthink. Um, so now when you have teams, when there's a lot of pressure, some teams will pick like a dedicated objector whose whole job is to object to things and bring up reasons why they're not good to try to prevent groupthink from causing a major um, failure of decision making like it did with Challenger. Okay, the next effect that we have to talk about under group dynamics is the bystander effect. The bystander effect is basically the tendency of witnesses or like bystanders, onlookers in an emergency to just stand around and like not actually help or provide assistance in an emergency if other people are present. The likelihood of each individual person providing help decreases by the number of bystanders present. The more bystanders there are around, the less likely it is any one individual is going to help. This is called the bystander effect. If you've ever had CPR training or like first aid training, they teach you when they teach you CPR to pick an individual person and describe them like by the color of their shirt or something like you in the green shirt, call 911. Because if you target a specific person, it helps to override the bystander effect. You're not generally calling to the crowd, somebody call 911. It's unlikely any one person will because everyone looking thinks someone else is going to do it. So by targeting an individual, you in the green, call 911, you're making certain that they're not going to suffer from the bystander effect and someone is actually going to help, right? So there was a famous story that was used to try to um, spread around like how horrible the bystander effect is and how awful all this stuff was. So the story is that in 1964, this woman named Kitty Genovese was stabbed to death in front of her apartment at 2.30 in the morning um, by this sort of attacker that came after her in three separate attacks over half an hour, it was overheard by 38 of her neighbors and no one helped her. This was a major story that was published all over the news. People were aghast, like how could this be possible? Um, you know, nobody, all these people overheard it, nobody decided to help her. The bystander effect was really strong and then it became this whole sort of legend that supported how powerful the bystander effect is and how unlikely it is that any individual is going to help in an emergency if there's a lot of onlookers. And it turns out a lot of the details of that story were not published correctly when it first came out in the news. So it resulted in this legend being spread that wasn't factual. So the fact of what happened is that there were two attacks, not three, and there were 10 minutes between them, not 30. There were some witnesses who shouted at the attacker and scared him away the first time. Some witnesses called the police after the first attack. Others called after the second. So we had people after both attacks helping. One witness after the second attack stayed with Kitty until the ambulance came to help her. So you did have a number of witnesses who didn't do anything, but you also had plenty of people who did. So the conclusion is yes, the bystander effect is a real thing. It decreases the likelihood of onlookers helping in an emergency, especially if there are a lot of witnesses. But individual people do help. Right? So it's not 100%. It's not like if there are 10 people looking on, nobody's going to help ever. It just means that groups are slower to help than individuals, and there are some members of the group that are less likely to help at all. Right. Also, if it's a real emergency, like a, a physical need, like somebody's trapped under debris of a building, or like there's some immediate like mortal danger, that decreases the bystander effect over it's like a flat tire or... Um, somebody hitchhiking. The bystander effect is stronger if the perception of the emergency is that it's not as big of a deal, right? So there are a number of different criteria that impact the bystander effect, and I have a practice activity I want you guys to do. Um, it's linked to this assignment in Google Classroom that will help you explore some of these criteria in more detail. Um, but that is it for the lecture on group dynamics. I hope you uh, enjoy the practice activities I have set up for you, and I'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.